EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. The year 3000, pop-punk band Busted once sang, will be the year the world's population will be living underwater, but how will Londoners beat rail strikes in the far future to get from A to B stress-free? There's concept hydro jet packs to zip us along the Thames to work, and even the tempting dream of being able to teleport straight into the office. But what is the art of the possible right now that will influence travel decisions in our lifetimes? That's the roar of jet engines strapped to the arms of inventor Richard Browning of Gravity Industries. He's Britain's real-life Iron Man. Now, we're lucky enough to get some time with the chief executive of Britain's leading transport research facility that's investigating everything from driverless cars to smart sensors and people's behaviour on the roads. It's called TRL, formerly the Transport Research Laboratory, which runs projects including autonomous vehicle trials at the Olympic Park and Greenwich Peninsula as part of the Smart Mobility Living Lab. It comes as the government unveils its driverless cars rollout plan for UK motorways by 2025. But in terms of TRL's already historic impact on your everyday life, it's the place where the zebra crossing was invented. We're joined by TRL's CEO, Paul Campion. So, Paul, what's the focus of TRL's research currently, with so much now being made possible with the digital boom? There's so much changing. IT, uh, mobile communications, which are sort of creating a digital twin of the physical world, which can enable us to, you know, to to, uh, manipulate things in very different ways. But there's still fundamental uh, work associated with infrastructure and structures with uh, vehicles, more importantly, perhaps with systems, they work, the way they work together. And in our view, perhaps most importantly, the way that these various technologies, uh, bits and pieces of science, interact with people's real world experience and the way that people behave. So we've got a big focus on actually behavioural science, on the way that people's behaviour, the things that people do, do are affected by their environment, affected by the the vehicles, the systems, the services they use, and uh, the impact that has on their their health, their well being, and so on and so forth. So so you know that whole spectrum: people, systems, vehicles, structures. What are the findings from TRL's behavioural research? We've done work on the way that um, people's electric vehicle charging behaviour can be influenced by. Uh, the way that the the economic incentives are offered to them, the way that the systems operate, you might say it's from the department of the blooming obvious. But you know, clearly, people's uh, willingness and ability to choose more economical or more environmentally friendly ways of charging electric vehicles depends quite strongly on the way that the offers are framed to them and the way that the systems work. Another area might be, you know, what we call in the jargon micro mobility that's to say e-scooters bikes all that sort of stuff understanding how people interact with those and what are safe behaviors how can we help people to be more safe when using those what are some of the challenges making sure these new modes of transport all blend together it's a good day to be asking that question because today the government uh, launched their vision for connected and automated mobility we're talking about self-driving cars the government is taking a very very bold step, I think, in saying that the UK will be one of the first and best places to adopt this technology because of the potential benefits they can see and the potential benefits there can be to the economy and to people's lives. And, uh, you know, I think it's very much to be commended that there's a very strong focus there on uh, what are all the legislative and regulatory changes that need to, to be made to enable this stuff to happen quickly but safely and to the benefit of people? The problem with this technology is that we tend to think of it as black and white, you know, self-driving car. I think I'll get into a car, take me to the shops and, you know, I'll sit in the back seat and read the paper. The reality will be that these technologies will bleed slowly into into our world. And many of your listeners may already be driving cars that have elements of 
automation in them. They might have an adaptive cruise control. They might have early versions of lane keeping, automatic lane keeping, which was which was uh, you know made legal only uh, within the last year. They might have you know automatic braking, safety system, self parking. These are all technologies which you know, beginning to bring in elements of automation. There are driverless shuttles. Uh, we're very used to, to, to um, sitting on driverless trains on the DLR, aren't we? So, you know, the, all around us, this technology is already there in existence. What have you learned from your driverless trials in Greenwich and at the Olympic Park? We built and we operate a thing called the Smart Mobility Living Lab, which is in London. As far as we know, it's the only public road uh, test bed in the world. Uh, and obviously it's in Europe's only mega city, which is London. That's in Greenwich. But we also have, uh, it's split actually, partly in uh, in Greenwich, partly uh, on the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. And so we've got a world-leading test facility to enable people to uh, test uh, you know, vehicles, systems, components even, um, within a community. Now, clearly, you can't put anything into that environment which is not safe and legal to use because they're public roads. You know, if you drove through it, you wouldn't even know you were driving through it. So we have a complete digital twin, as it's called, a, a cyber representation of that entire environment that people can use to test in cyber space in simulation so that they can be sure that uh, before they go on to the public roads that things are safe they can then validate their findings uh, in the real world and you know come back to your question how do learnings from facilities like that feed forward as the as these new things come well that's a that's a really important and uh, you know an all, not always straightforward question your listeners probably have experience of using or at least seeing people using new devices like e-scooters in ways that sometimes don't seem in fact very often are not particularly safe and the cultural assumptions that we have around some of these things don't always develop at the same speed as the technology. So I can't imagine that anyone would think it would be sensible today to go on a motorcycle without wearing a helmet. It's been the law for quite a long time. And culturally, it is accepted that you wear a helmet when you ride a motorcycle. Well, some of these e-devices can travel uh, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour, sometimes even faster. And yet we very often see people traveling around without a helmet. And in a legislation, perhaps more importantly, the culture hasn't quite caught up with those uh, those new devices yet. Also, the way, as you pointed out, the way that these, you know, these new things interact with the existing road users, you know, still settling down, to put it mildly. Let's go to the ads. Stay there to hear more on smart travel and whether AI-powered cars could signal an end to road rage. Why not hit rate and follow in the meantime? Welcome back. Well, of course, the bicycle is a fantastic way to get around London. But what's your view on whether there's also any better alternatives to rail travel to give travellers more independence and maybe even beat future strikes? For many people who can't afford a car or whose circumstances don't enable them to practically keep a car, I remember only about, I think it's less than 50% of people in uh, London have access to a privately owned car. For those people, you know, freedom is Public transport, actually, I prefer the, the American phrase mass transit to public transport because public transport comes freighted with a whole set of implications and associations, which I don't think are always helpful to debate. The issue we've got here is that there is a fundamental uh, conflict between my wish to go where I want, whenever I want, as quickly as possible, and the need to make sure that the overall system, the network of a city like London operates efficiently. My hope is that my freedom to travel, uh, my autonomy is maximised by an overall system that gets me to where I want to be, or by the way, gets the goods to my door, the other part of the, the equation, in the most efficient and effective way. And I think, uh, you know, we can imagine the changes in the future move away from a relatively small number of ways of traveling. You know, we talked about the, the private car, we talked about 
the bus, we talked about the tube, to a world in which actually there are more alternatives. What role will smart materials play in future transport infrastructure, particularly to help London decarbonise? Transport, as you know, is the single largest uh, emitting sector in the in the economy, responsible for more than more than a quarter of all uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So decarbonising transport is really, really important. And one of the ways we're going to do that is by looking at new materials. There's tens, perhaps 100,000 miles of roads in you know, the London area. And maintaining that, filling the potholes, uh, you know, adapting to change, putting in uh, EV charging points, for example, a great example of you know, maintenance of updating and changing the function of our infrastructure. That is, is a very big um, emitter in its own right. And we're going to have to find alternatives to traditional steel, concrete. You know, these are very, very carbon intensive products. So smart materials, new materials, utterly critical in meeting that challenge. And what about those jetpacks? Will they be a thing? I will admit to complete ignorance about jetpacks, so I, I don't want to venture an opinion on there. But what I will say is that the third dimension, I think, will be a, a critical part of our transport mix much sooner than a century from now. We've, we've got to remember that we focus on personal mobility. You know, We focus on the journey to work or taking the kids to school. But everything we wear, everything we eat, everything we own, every every part of our lives is bound up with transport. And all of that stuff has to be moved backs and forwards. Freight, in, in the widest sense, is uh, unfortunately sometimes the Cinderella of transport. We don't talk about it enough, we don't think about it enough. I can absolutely see drone delivery being a part of the mix. Now, we've got to recognise that um, it's not particularly energy efficient. Okay, it's always going to take more uh, more energy to lift a kilogram of freight up you know, 50 feet in the air and take it a couple of miles down the road and then drop it down than it would to run the same kilogram of stuff along a road. So it's less energy efficient. As and when we get to a point where we have more renewable energy available, then I think as part of a system, it can absolutely make sense because there will be some journeys where actually the, the, the as you like, the reductive question about how much energy did it take the kilogram of freight is the wrong question to answer because it might be much more efficient to lift just your package from a distribution centre to a couple of miles down the road by drone than it would be to run a seven-ton lorry. How important are the likes of sensors and Wi-Fi meshing to power future smart cities? As it happens earlier this week, I was cutting the ribbon with a colleague of mine from Virgin Media O2 on the upgrade they've given to the Smart Ability Living Lab to uh, to make it a 5G test bed. And uh, this question of what is the IT, the communications substructure that you need to enable all this transport goodness is a critical one. One of the things that we're very active in is precisely this, you know, this digital layer, this uh, this digital infrastructure to enable some of these systems. In Greenwich, a large Japanese car manufacturer is testing uh, with us some, I think I can say it's Nissan, are, are testing some of their um, autonomy technology uh, with us there. And one of the things we're working with them on is is sort of infrastructural awareness. So there is a junction coming off around uh, roundabout, going around a corner, and you can't see it, but hidden around the corner is a, uh, a bus stop. Actually, it's a bus parking spot where buses sometimes uh, linger for some time to you know, make up the timetable or to you know, change drivers, whatever it may be. And all the human drivers know that as they leave this roundabout, they need to be in the outside lane because the inside lane might be blocked with the bus. Computers don't know that. And so what we're doing is we are adding uh, a situational awareness. We've got uh, cameras, we've got sensors that can identify that a bus is there and they can broadcast that information so that systems like an automated car can pick it up and then the, the car can make a decision to say, oh, okay, well, if the lane I'm in is going to be blocked, uh, you know, 200 metres, I will now move into the outside lane instead of risk getting stuck in the middle. And finally, thanks for your time. With all those driverless cars in the future, are there any hopes it will signal an end to road rage? We've done work on this as, as other people 
have done. A part of the government's announcement today is an aspiration to ensure that cars, uh, automated cars, are not introduced until they are as safe as a careful and competent driver. Is, uh, is the language they're using? Well, careful and competent drivers don't get road rage, and uh, you know I think. Uh, it was all dangerous to speculate about the future, but I think I've been confident in saying that um, an AI system is not going to get out of bed on the wrong side and start swearing at the driver in the next lane. So from that perspective, you know, there will be one fewer person to uh, to pick a fight with. Do I think that we can, you know, we can magic away the human element? Not only do I not think we can, I don't think it's even perhaps desirable, but recognising the way that people interact with with you know their vehicles with the infrastructure with other vehicles other drivers is a critical part of making our roads safe and efficient there's more news in the evening standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk that's the leader we're back on monday at 4 p.m <laughs>